When I wake, for a second I'm not sure what this feeling is. Everything is the same and yet everything has changed. Then, before I've even opened my eyes, there's a rush of noise in my head like an underground train. And there it is, playing out in technicolour scenes I can't pause or mute. I press the heels of my palms into my temples, as though I can make the images subside through brute force alone. But still they come, thick and fast, as if without them I might forget. Prepare to be a bit creeped out and feel chills down your back in the penultimate episode of this series. Claire McIntosh has a clever tale to tell in I Let You Go. So let's get talking straight away about why this book has made our shortlist. Well, I guess it kind of grabs you from the off, doesn't it? This, this awful scene with this young mother walking along with her, her little boy. Everything seems fine. She's happy. He's happy. And hence the title, She Lets Him Go. She lets him cross the road where he's hit by a hit-and-run driver. He's killed. He, d he dies almost at once at the scene. And the, whoever the driver of the car is, old man, young man, old woman, young woman, we don't know, they drive away. And the police investigation begins and to find out who's responsible and very quickly it just runs into the sand doesn't it? Runs into the sand as you say they can't find any leads any trace and uh, the the couple of police inspectors who are looking after the case are kind of they put they come in under pressure from uh, their chief constable to kind of to drop it drop the case because they're not getting anywhere and obviously the publicity is terrible so it kind of fades into obscurity so and we're so left with this, this anguished mother this poor poor this mother poor poor woman and then this is where this is how clever the the book gets and I can't give very much away it's very frustrating to talk about it but the point is there is this amazing twist what happens is that you that, that we have this initial bit where this poor little boy dies um, his five-year-old dies and there's all this police palaver and everything and then you kind of skip completely away from that and you meet someone called Jenna a woman called Jenna Gray who's had some terrible um, terrible uh, trauma in her own life her own life has been ruined for some reason we don't know, we don't what, know what yet we no. don't know what but her own life has been ruined and we, we capture her running away from her own life her own home uh, taking nothing with her she's an artist she was a sculptor but she takes nothing with her and she finds her way into Wales from Bristol which is where she was living she finds her way um, into Wales and she finds her way along to the uh, west the, 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 the Wales coast <coughs> and she rents she got very little money but she's got just enough to get by and she rents a very cheap tumble-down old uh, cottage on the coast and tries and we don't know why but she's trying to make a new life for herself and as I know to my cost, because you read this book before I did, there's an amazing twist, uh, not, not right at the end, but as you get towards the end, which actually made you scream out loud. Extraordinary. Um, and it's one of the cleverest twists either of us have ever sort of encountered in a novel. It is quite it? extraordinary. So, and yet the author... And you can't see it coming. You no. really can't. Um, my word, it works. But it's a kind of it's a story also. I mean, Jen is a very interesting character. She's escaping from a terribly ab abusive relationship, and she... Um, you know, she's aware that this person, this the person she's escaping from, is sort of catching up with her. So it's like a, a it's like suspense within suspense. It's two different stories which are actually, although you don't know it, very closely linked together. You don't know that until the end. It's a brilliant book, I think, for a first novel. It's really accomplished and really confident. Can't wait to read the next one. This is the Richard and Judy Book Club podcast, exclusive to W. H. Smith. Settle down for a good read. I read a mixture of things and I would be really hesitant to give you a favourite author but um, recently I've read uh, books by S.J. Watson so I read Second Life which I really really enjoyed. Uh, I also, I, I'm a big fan of psychological thrillers and, and of crime and probably one of the first authors I read in that genre was Sophie Hanna whose books I really really enjoyed. Um, and in my bag right now that I started reading this morning is The Memory Book by Rowan Coleman. So a real range of titles. I'd like to be able to say that I have a fantastically organised writing routine and that I've written a thousand words before breakfast, but it wouldn't be true. So um, most days I follow pretty much the same process. I get up, um, shake the children out of bed, make sure they've had some breakfast, take them to the, to the uh, bus stop to go to school and then I walk the dog and while I walk the dog I'm already writing so I start to write in my head 
um, and not just plan out the scene that I'm going to write, but I think about the, the actual words that, that are going to start off that scene so that when I get back to my office, I can start writing. I find it quite difficult to write until I've cleared my head of other things and cleared my inbox of emails so I do tend to, to get on with all that sort of stuff first but I try and get a thousand words done um, by about one or two o'clock. So what's so incredible is that when you write a book you have this idea in your head and it's just in your head and nobody else's and then gradually you start to tell people other people read the book and then when your book's published you suddenly know that real people in the real world are, are reading it and talking about it hopefully and, and book clubs exacerbate that process so that suddenly you've got people sitting around in a group talking about something that just started as a tiny idea in your head. Um, it's incredibly exciting and I just hope that everybody reads I Let You Go and enjoys it and talks about it and thinks up their own questions about it and I'm really looking forward to hearing what people think. The best advice that I could give somebody who wants to write a book is just to write it. And I know that's really, really trite advice, um, but it, it's, it's the best one. You, you, until you've finished your book, you can't do anything with it. You've just got to finish it. And I think the biggest excuse that we give ourselves is that we haven't got time and I think largely that, that's, that's rubbish because we've all got time, we, we've all got something we can give up and it might be you know, an hour in bed or it might be Coronation Street because actually if you write 500 words a day which is you know, about what you might write in a, a, an email to somebody then you've got a book by the end of the year so um, there's no excuse really, you just have to write. Joining us now is Claire McIntosh, who's written her first novel, and it's a really original and terrific thriller called I Let You Go. Congratulations, Claire. Thank you. Lovely to see you. Thank you. It's lovely to be here. It, it's a, it's an, I'll tell you the thing about this book, I Let You Go. We'll talk about the actual plot in a second, but the thing about it is this incredible twist, which I defy anyone. Mm -hmm. Everyone I know who's read this um, says the same thing about it, that it is quite extraordinary. You just do not know what's coming. Judy, um, actually, she, she read your book first ahead of me, because we, we split the, the books when we picked them. She went first with I Let You Go, and she actually screamed out loud. <laughs> she honestly, honestly, she was sitting in bed, and you went, ah! I said, what, what? And you said, that is one hell of a plot twist. It is indeed. And it is. It is it indeed. Is. And all I want to say is, because we can't obviously mention the twist, because it will spoil it for everybody else, well done. And it must, <laughs> did it take you. you forever to think about it? Or? No, because the, it, because the twist came first. Really? And, and then everything uh, else was built around it. Yes. Um, well, it would have to be actually thinking about it. Yes, yeah. you're right. Well, let's talk about the plot. The, the book opens, I Let You Go opens, with um, a mother who is walking her five-year-old son home from school one day and uh, he's running away, you know, he's with her, they're holding hands, having a great time. You don't actually know at the very beginning um, what their relationship is. It becomes very um, clear very quickly. And they're very happy, and uh, he runs across the road. She lets him go, literally, uh, to run across a road to their house, and he's knocked over. Uh, he's knocked over and sadly killed by a hit-and-run driver. And that's how, that's how the plot starts. And yep. the mother is obviously devastated and, and, and um, in a dreadful state. And we start off with what seems to be a straightforward police investigation, don't we? Tell us about the detective and her mate. Ray. So um, we've got two detectives, our, our DI, our Detective Inspector Ray Stevens, mm -hmm. uh, and then his DC Kate. And they're both very hardworking, uh, working in Bristol CID. Um, and absolutely determined to find out who the driver of this hit and run was. Right, and and they're having they're having great difficulty in finding that because they simply can't trace. Absolutely, there's the, there are very few um, leads. Uh, they they exhaust everything that they possibly can, and gradually the case pretty much grinds to a halt. Mm. Uh, and there's some pressure from their chief constable to draw a line under it, uh, it's making the force look bad mm -hmm. because then they haven't solved it and so they, they're told to drop the case. What's really interesting is that you are an ex-cop yourself. I am. And this story has its, has its bones really in a real life tragedy like this, it was a, except it was a nine-year-old, wasn't it? it? It does, yes, and I, I'm, I'm sort of conscious to, to 
point out that that's that's not their story. It's no. it's, it's a very different one. But, but, you, but certainly, you share the frustration it really and... inspired me. I, I, th yeah. This accident had happened um, shortly after I joined the police, and it really formed the backdrop to my career as as, as mm. a police officer, because I I was I found it just incredulous that out there was someone that still now to this day that there's somebody out there 14 years later who knows they've killed a child and other people who know what happened and nobody has come forward so to, that's to say that. So that's never been solved? It's never been solved. And you, you say, I mean that's interesting what you say about other people must know. You think other people close to this driver must Absolutely. know who he or she is? Absolutely. Why, were there passengers in the there car? Were, there were, in this particular case there were, there were people in, in the car who, who knew and so that they're, they're carrying around that secret. And this family who lost a child 14 years ago had yes. never had that closure. And, and so it, it just became something that uh, that haunted me. Yeah. The, the, and I wanted it to would. explore the, the consequences of a crime and, like that. And what did, without going into the detail of the book you've written, but just share your thoughts with us on this. What do you think somebody who commits that kind of crime and has to live with it, do you think they go through a, a suffering? Or do you think that, that by definition they are just horrendously callous? Uh, unable to live with this dreadful thing they've done. I think that's really interesting. I think that nobody or very few people are as black and white as to be mm. uh, completely evil or completely good. Yeah. And so I would hope that there is an element of remorse in anyone. And I, I guess those levels are going to be different depending on your personality. But I think it's a mixture of fear, of guilt, um, and, and of arrogance mm. that they can get away with it. Mm. Um, you know, whatever crime's being committed, there are lots of crimes that people don't own up to, and there's but an my, arrogance that they'll never be caught and my, that they shouldn't be caught. My God, though, I mean, just to think of the real life case that, that we were talking about, I mean, the level of trust you then have to have and the, the people who know what you've done Absolutely. and are complicit in it. And what they've got over you then. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, then, to move on, because that, as that, that is, that's how the novel starts. That is indeed at the core of the novel, that, that tragic hit and run. But it's very, very cleverly written because we then very quickly move on from that to Jenna, Jenna Gray, um, who is escaping from something in her life, which we are not at all sure exactly what's happened, but something terrible has happened to her and she just has to go. Um, and such is the skill of the way you've written it that the connection between Jenna Gray and the accident is very ambivalent. It's somehow there, but you don't actually, it's not in your face. It's just something that you assume. Now, Jenna makes her way to a, a sort of, um, are you from Bristol, by the way? Because she, she I was goes, born in Bristol, born in Bristol right? I haven't lived there for right. any length of time, but I was born there. But she makes her way to Wales um, and she finds a cottage to rent to start a new life. It's a very tumble down old cottage. Um, and uh, she starts, she tries to start again there. She does, she starts a new life and she meets new people and she sort of starts to sort of make friends and all the rest of it. Um, and uh, then something really strange starts to happen to her as well. She, she's a, t tell us about her, what she does. Uh, she makes sand. She, she, draws, the cards. she draws pictures in, in the sand, yeah. uh, so she writes words, letters in, in the sand and then she takes photographs of them and she sells those photographs. So it's an extent, she's an artist and, and, and what she used to do was sculpt. She's, uh, she has an injury that means she can't do that anymore and so this is a, a, a different facet to her right. artistic endeavours. Well tell us a bit about yourself because this is a really interesting career change this. I mean so many people want to write and think that they, they can write but they never actually have the courage to do it because usually to do it properly you have to stop working, you know, you just have to. Mm. You tried to fit both in, you were working a 50 hour week um, as, a, as a police officer and you, and you were trying to write and, and getting some stuff done but it was just impossible so you just did it, you just quit yeah. and sat down. I mean, was that a pressure, knowing that you'd walked away from a career and into it this uncertain world? Was, it still is a bit, actually, if I'm honest. Um, oh, you've got nothing to worry about. <laughs> it, uh, it was a huge decision, um, but you know how people say don't, don't give up the day job? I, I think you do need to do that. I think you have to give up the day job, and because there's, there's nothing like necessity to make something work. And so if you've got a mortgage to pay, and you know the only thing you know how to do is, is write, and that has to pay the bills, then you'll make it work uh, and so that's that's what I did but it was a big decision because it's not just the you know having a regular paycheck it's the promise of a, a pension it's mm. the security it's the career progression and, also, and you know, I, mean, I was getting promoted and 
I what thought. What rank I'd, did you get to? I, well, I was an inspector when I left. Wow. Um, so I, you know, I thought I would carry on going up the ranks. Be because I would have thought that being a, a police officer and, and and going through the ranks at that level at your young age is very much a vocation in the way that writing's a vocation. So why why, do, why was writing a stronger pull, a stronger vocation than being a, a policeman? Well, I, I think if I'm honest, it wasn't writing that, that was the stronger pull, it was my children. Uh -huh. And it was the fact that actually I, I realised I couldn't have the career I thought I was going to have and also be the sort of mother I wanted to be. Hmm. And so... Your children are quite young. They, they are. I mean, they're, they're eight, seven and seven. Mm. Um, and so at the time they were f f four, three and three. And the nanny saw them more than I did. And that wasn't it. Wasn't how I wanted to to bring up my children. So. And you also um, very tragically, and this is not in any sense related to the book, except in one way because it is about loss. You did, did lose a child, didn't you? I did. You? Yes. Uh, to a, a very young, a baby. A, a baby. I, so I have. I had two sets of twins, and my first set of twin Gosh. twins were born very very early, and, and we lost one to meningitis when he was five weeks old. Oh. Yeah. Uh, and, and I do write about that a lot, that, that's the, you know, the grief that mm. Jenna feels is, is my grief. Yeah, mm. yeah. We can't, um, as I said when I was reviewing your book, I mean, it, it's so annoying because I want to sort of go into deep, more detail <laughs> about the book. But the twist, I have to tell anybody who's uh, listening to this, the twist, in, in, which involves Jenna and the hit and run and everything, is just massive. Um, and I know that very many established crime thriller writers have actually said, and I've heard them say it, God, I wish I'd thought of that. So it, it really... <laughs> It really is. It's it's fantastic book to read. Um, it's a great first novel. Um, are you sort of? I, I know everyone dreads this question. Are you in the middle of a second one now, or have you? I am. In, I'm about a third of the way through my my second one, um, and trying not to focus too much on people saying this this is really good. I really enjoyed. It. I yeah, let yeah. you go. I really like the twist. Yes. I'm just trying to. You're write. right. First you novels are first successful as this you? is. Um, they they cast a long shadow, don't they, over the second one? I feel we slightly pressurised. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. and, 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 uh, and does the second one does it involve Kate and no, Ray? No, it's, no, a, it's totally a, stand, a standalone psychological thriller. Well, listen. I'm sure lots of people think. What was it? What's it called again? What? what I let what? It's I let you go by Claire McIntosh, um, and if you get it uh, from W. H. Smith um, under the aegis of uh, the Richard and Judy Book Club, and you can't miss it because it's on its own stand, it's got its own stickers, uh, you will find lots of um, extra content in the back of the book. Uh, there's Q&As, questions that we haven't asked here, which we put to, uh, to Claire, and uh, hints from her on writing and all the rest of it. Loads of stuff, but you only get it if you buy it from W. H. Smith. So enjoy and have a good summer. I recently read The Goldfinch, which is probably the best book I've ever read. Uh, I really, I was really surprised. I've got dyslexia and I find reading very difficult. And I was shocked, absolutely shocked, about how easy it was to read. The writing was so good because it flows. It just flows off the page and it's effortless. From Richard and Judy Book Club, I read Iron Pilgrim. Once you got into it, it really opened up some of the not so nice things that happen in Afghanistan. It showed you how far back somebody planned to get revenge. The murder bag, Tony Parsons. He is an extraordinary writer anyway, and of course I've always read his books and found him amazing. This is a completely different avenue for him, going down the crime route. And his hero in this book, he's a single parent, but he's a very tough man. He reminded me a lot of Rebus with even more baggage, it would seem. Thanks for downloading our podcasts. We hope you're enjoying them. And do please keep your comments coming in. A song for Issy Bradley by Caris Bray. Before Izzy died, Mum used to read a fairy tale each night from the old fat book that she'd been given as a present when she was a little girl. Afterwards, she would get the Bible and the Book of Mormon picture books out and read a story from one of them, too. Jacob's favourite fairy tale used to be The Wolf and the Seven Goats. The best bit was the part where the mother goat opened up the wolf and her kids tumbled out of his big furry belly. The Wolf and the Seven Goats is just made up, but the story of Jonah and the Whale is a real-life miracle. Jonah got stuck in a whale and survived. In the Bible and the Book of Mormon, there are even better stories than Jonah's. Stories about people who died and came back to life. Like the story of Lazarus. Jacob remembers it because there's a bit where Lazarus is so dead, Martha says, he stinketh. And after they read it, Mum occasionally said, who stinketh, when someone did a trump. We very much hope that you'll come back to meet our final author in this collection. <laughs>
Join us and Karis Bray next time on the Richard and Judy Book Club podcast. Don't forget, you can still listen to each and every one of the past author interviews from the Richard and Judy Book Club podcast. Visit www.whsmith.co.uk forward slash Richard and Judy or search in the iTunes podcast store and the Stitcher radio directory.